Amen. He answers prayer. And if, I, if you're looking at me like, uh, you're, I don't know you. Uh, I'm Pastor Steve. I'm, uh, I'm a pastor at New Life Church. And I was invited this morning to share with you uh, in this stream of prayer, which I, I know the Red Church has had uh, wrapped up this last Wednesday, the month of prayer. And uh, the series continues in it. And so I'm excited to join you this morning and uh, just add whatever two cents that I'm able to and uh, the Holy Spirit's million dollars uh, into this flow of prayer that you're already into. Um, so I'm excited. I want to jump right in if I could. And uh, those that are online, uh, welcome. I'm glad that you're joining here as well. Um, I want to share a message with you this morning called On Earth as it is in Heaven. Now, I know that I think the Lord's Prayer was already presented as a template uh, for, uh, for prayer in the month of prayer early on. And so, of course, this theme comes from the words of Jesus that we contend that the Lord's, the kingdom, his kingdom come, as will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Um, and specifically uh, related to a, an aspect of prayer that we relate to is called intercession. Um, and that is a term that we'll define in a moment and take a look at more deeply. Um, but before I begin, I want to ask a question. How many of you have heard the name uh, Daniel Nash? Yeah, that's what I thought. It's okay. <laughs> Yeah, who's Daniel Nash? Do I know him from, from school? Did I go to school with Daniel? No. Uh, what about Charles Finney? Anybody heard of Charles Finney? Maybe a few. Okay, I see, I see a few. More. How about the Second Great Awakening? Maybe. Yeah, a few of the. Okay. So in the early, early uh, years of, of uh, American colonies and to the foundations of our, of our nation, uh, there were a couple of these revival movements. Uh, first Great Awakening and the Second Great Awakening. The Second Great Awakening took place in the 1800s. And uh, Charles Finney was a signature uh, figure in that movement. He, he was the, the, the leader of it. He, would, uh, he totally reorganized what an what a, what a evangelism campaign can look like. And a lot of churches, actually even today, still model much of the flow of their services and, uh, around uh, the innovations that, that, that Finney produced. Uh, behind Finney was a man named Daniel Nash. Finney was the front man. He was the, uh, he was the name on all the banners. Uh, when Finney's coming to town, people wanted, whether they, they, they it was kind of like Billy Graham. It's kind of like some people liked him, some people hated him. But no matter which side you, you're on of Finney, you kind of wanted to see him because you're just mesmerized by what, what, what his contribution is. You, so much about his name has been heard. Um, and so behind him, there was this man named Daniel Nash. Nash started his ministry. He was upstate New York. He was a, a pastor. Uh, we don't know a lot about his early years or even at, at the point he, he uh, what led him into ministry. But uh, after some time in church work, uh, he decided he wanted to support full-time Finney's ministry in some way. He had a heart for prayer, had developed it on his own, and uh, had connected with Finney. And so what he would begin to do is he would, go ahead of, uh, he would go ahead of Charles Finney maybe three or four weeks in advance of a meeting that was scheduled. And he would rent a room, like a boarding, a boarding house. And he would gather, if he could, from local churches, just a handful of people that had like-minded uh, interests in terms of prayer, and then he would spend several weeks, nothing doing but just on his face before the Lord and just praying that the Holy Spirit would be poured out. He just was interceding for that city, that town, that region, that area. And Finney writes in, in one, of his, one of his books uh, about Nash, he writes this, says, when I got the to town to start a revival, a lady contacted me who ran a boarding house. She said, Brother Finney, do you know a Father Nash? Uh, he and two other men have been uh, at my boarding house for the last three days, uh, and they haven't eaten a bite of food. I opened the door to peep in on them because I could hear them groaning, and I saw down on their faces, and they have been this way for three days, prostrate on the floor and groaning. And I thought something awful must have happened to them, and I was afraid to go in. I didn't know what to do. Would you come and see about them? And Finney's response was, no, it isn't necessary. Uh, as I reply, they, they just have a spirit of travail in prayer. Pretty fascinating. Uh, often uh, they called, he, had a, he became known as Father Nash, you know, colloquially. And uh, he wouldn't attend the meetings often. He kept out of sight, and you would just pray through the meetings that the Holy Spirit would fall and uh, bring hearts to, to Christ. Um, shortly, uh, uh, shortly before he died, uh, Nash uh, wrote this in a diary. He said, I'm now convinced it's my duty and privilege, as it is the duty of every Christian, to pray for as much of the Holy Spirit to come down as it did on Pentecost, and a great deal more. My body is in pain, 
but I'm happy in God. I have only just begun to understand what Jesus meant when he said, all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. And then he, uh, he did pass. And interestingly, it's just an interesting correlation, but four months, less than four months from Nash's death, uh, Finney stopped the evangelism campaigns and took a, took a post leading a church in New York City. And so his whole ministry changed. And I think it could be argued persuasively that um, his intercessor friend and the impact of that prayer was now missed. It was gone. Um, there's a tombstone. In fact, I think there's an image um, of his tombstone. It lies in upstate New York in the border of Canada. And from what I understand, it's uh, a neglected cemetery. But uh, it just it's a simple little epigraph here that just says, uh, labored with Finney, mighty in prayer. And it gives his date. And um, it's a powerful little small but, but not insignificant uh, tombstone. Daniel Nash. Except for this sermon, you probably have never heard his name and you might never hear it again. And yet you could probably say that uh, so many churches were planted, souls were saved um, because of Finney's work. And we know uh, for some of you, now you know Finney too. <laughs> and um, there's two sides of prayer. There's the side of prayer. And if you read books on prayer and sermons on prayer, podcasts on prayer. It can be organized maybe in these two ways. There's an aspect of prayer that orders the inner world. And when we pray, we change. And some prayer books, that's really the emphasis that, that they lead with, that when you pray, it's not about your circumstances, but it's about the inward change, that you align with God, your desires align with God. And, uh, and then God, of course, wants to fulfill that in your life because there's now an alignment with his purposes and his will in your life. And that's certainly true. We Prayer does order our inner world. Amen to that. Amen. Okay, he does. He wants to see us flourish with joy and peace. He wants your life um, to uh, bloom fully in, in his purposes. Um, there's another aspect of prayer, like a coin. You flip, flip the coin over. And that is that prayer is about also ordering our external world. It's not just about the inner world. It is about ordering the external world. I'll make a case for this as we go on. But the New Testament is clear that although our call to prayer uh, is something internal, it's also about partnering with God. He has a mission. He wants to alter the course of external affairs in your life specifically. Now that you know, once, you, once, once a person has, has, uh, has been captured by the Holy Spirit and you give your life to the Lord, he's on a mission to draw you not just closer with him personally, but to draw the whole sphere of your life closer to him as well. And he wants to use you. And specifically, I want to argue this morning that it's primarily through this role of intercession. Now, intercession can be defined, maybe you might think of it as prayer, and we'll use it in that way, but it's not limited to prayer. The Old Testament category is about petition and supplication. It would be like personal prayer. It's, it's saying, I'm making requests to God on my own behalf. God, would you open the door for employment? God, would you, um, Lord, I, I don't feel too good today. Would you heal my body? Um, Lord, would I need a breakthrough in finances. God, would you, would you guide my decisions that my future would be, uh, would, would be ordered by you? Um, intercession is a category where we are, we're praying for others. It's not of self-interest. Maybe, uh, maybe it's a loved one. Uh, there's... You know, it may be uh, you know, an un unsaved loved one, or in some places, maybe it's an unsaved loved one, un unloved saved one. <laughs> Either category. But you're praying for somebody else, and uh, you're taking on their, their interest in prayer. Lord, not just my body, but I pray that, that for their healing. God, I pray that uh, for salvation for, 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 uh, for Sally. I pray uh, that you'd open the door of employment for, uh, for, for, for Uncle Jim. And uh, intercessor can be defined, I think, just in this way. It's, it's a mediator. Uh, maybe one of the best examples, I think, in the Old Testament of this would be the, the, the class of the priests. The priests would, um, they specifically served in a way where um, holy God wants to have relationship and abide in the camp, right, with unholy humanity. Right? There's nobody in the camp of Israel that can actually be in his presence without dying. That's, that's, that's the problem the Old Testament presents for us, right? So the priests step in between. What do they do? They offer a sacrifice. It's an animal sacrifice. Its blood has to be shed in order, right, so that unholy man can actually still be in, in the presence of holy God. And the priests are these mediator. That's what their role is. That, that's, and they continually in the Old Testament, 
they're offering sacrifice, offering sacrifice, offering sacrifice, offering sacrifice, so that they can sustain this presence of God in the camp. And that is the role of the priest. Um, in New Testament Greek, it would be referred to like a negotiating party. If we had an army um, and we're going to send out a, a, you know, a, a PR team to go meet in the middle of the, of the field and try to negotiate terms before we have to go to battle. And so what, they're going to make a deal. Right? They're the go-between. It's someone who's going to mediate on our behalf. They represent, they advocate, um, they negotiate terms. That would be like an intercessor. It's a go-between. It's a mediator. And I think in light of, of, of our, our emphasis on prayer here at Red, um, I want to present this to you. God's inviting you. He wants to invite you to partner with him. Now, is it relationship? Sure, it's relationship. Does he want you to, to pray for yourself? Yeah, of course, he does. But there's also a partnership that's beyond just our own interest. It's, it's a partnership to expand his mission, expand his kingdom, and he wants to use you in a very particular way, and it's in this way called intercession. All right, can we say intercession? Intercession. intercession. All right, this is a simple, this is a very simple message this morning. Intercession is what God does. This is what he does. And um, not that long ago, I was just doing a, a study in this topic, and I was just kind of blown away thinking about all the ways that God in the persons of the Godhead are involved in intercession. And so I want to share some of those aha moments that I had with you. Number one, the Holy Spirit's an intercessor. Uh, Romans 8, 26, 27 says, Likewise, the Spirit of God helps us in our weakness. I felt weak at times. Isn't it great to know that uh, God has his eye on you? And even in your weakness, he wants to supply strength. For we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. He's an intercessor. And his whole role is to take up your interest, to understand what it is that, that you need in a moment to come alongside, to, to woo your heart, to invite you to, to take that step of faith, to trust him in something, to take a risk in something, to uh, love bigger, love more, uh, provide favor, provide an opening, an opportunity, maybe bring protection, bring provision. This is the Holy Spirit's role, you know? I was thinking, you know, recently about what it takes. I'm a, I'm a dad of four kids, and uh, it's a unique thing when uh, a child of their own accord takes interest in a parent. Uh, it's a big deal, right, to set their own interest aside in that very moment simply to kind of say, pay attention, right? They'd have to know you well enough to understand what you need, what you want, what you might want. They listen enough to know that, like, okay, I've heard Dad say this a number of times, you know. And it's not that they're even just seeking just to, to, to please me, but they want to do something of their own accord. The Holy, the Holy Spirit has this role with us, doesn't he? He's, he, take, he takes your interest. He really wants to know. and, and Now, he wants to know. He knows you better than yourself. And he's working on your behalf. Think of the labels in the New Testament for him, like uh, advocate. He's your advocate. Uh, he goes to court for you. <laughs> he goes to bat for you. He's your comforter. He's your counselor. He's your guide. He's your teacher. Um, he's, this is the Holy Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit. I, uh, when I was... I grew up in a, in, a, in a Christian home. My parents were, were believers. And when I was a kid, they, um, they started attending some charismatic churches, kind of a spirit-filled theology, that persuasion. And I still hold that today. Um, and I would hear, in particular, my mom pray in tongues. Um, we had Bible study meetings in our home. And, uh, and we'd, we, we used to call a hot seat. We'd have, we'd have a chair. It would pull up. We'd ask someone had need, you know, sit in the middle. We'd all gather around. And we'd shandai for a minute. You know, maybe a couple minutes, and just let the Holy Spirit just kind of have His way in a moment. And I saw some incredible miracles take place in those little small Bible study meetings. And I was about 13, roughly, in, in the living room. And I think I asked my mom about about you know, what she's doing when she prays in tongues. And and um, so she, I think we prayed together. She asked, you know, for the baptism of the Spirit. And um, so I uh, I don't remember feeling anything in particular about it. Uh, in my bedroom alone at times from that point onward, you know, I just developed kind of a little prayer language, if you will. What Paul would say is uh, uh, praying in the Spirit. 
And so I then went to, um, I'll spare all, 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 the, all the, 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 the contours of my journey, but I landed myself in a, in a Bible school in upstate New York when I was about age 20. And I began to question uh, what I had, what this was. Because <laughs> it was developed in private, and I kept it private. I didn't go into a public meeting leading with Sean dies, you know. Um, and so the question I began to have in adulthood was, was am I just making this up? Like, is this, is this really the Holy Spirit? Is this, is this me? I'm in a company of people that are, that are you know, speaking in tongues, and, and yet this feels very kind of like awkward and funny for me. And, um, but rather than retreating from it altogether, I, want, I just put it up as a prayer. I said, God, would you confirm for me? Like, is, if this is real, I want it to be real. And I mean, I've had those moments. You're like, God, I, I'm not going to make believe this anymore. If this is you, make it, you've got to make it happen. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not just going to pretend. Um, and so anyway, uh, that was my prayer. Not long after that, that moment, uh, really season, I was uh, assigned, it was a Bible school, right? So I was assigned to a prayer group that prayed for the Middle East. And I was in a small group meeting, uh, just a handful of maybe, maybe eight to ten different students. And uh, we all took turns praying for different things happening in the region at the time. And so I, I stepped up to pray. And, and um, as I'm praying, I suddenly began to pray in English like I have never prayed in my life. I had a stream of thought that was not my own. Uh, attention to vocabulary that was seemingly extraordinary. And a, like an umph. <laughs> <laughs> I just had this, this internal push of like this burden that just came out of nowhere. And it was just this flow of a language. It was my own language. This is English. I speak English. You know? But I don't speak English like that. <laughs> and it was a really unique experience. But God answered my prayer. They're like, you know what? If I can control your English, I can. yeah, it's, it's me as well behind, behind you, you speaking in tongues. And, uh, and I never really questioned it again. Um, and it was a bold, and anyway, I became aware of what it felt like when the Holy Spirit is really, when I, when I release it unto the Lord. And so that's a part of my own journey. But, I, but I, what, I, what, I, what I sensed that moment is the Holy Spirit was partnering. Okay? What was I doing? I was interceding. I was taking on an interest that was taking place in the Middle East, far from where I live, but praying for others, that the Holy Spirit would, would move there, that the kingdom of God would happen there. And, uh, and, and the Holy Spirit's like, I'm going to take that, and we're going uh, to partner. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. You know, the God the Son is an intercessor. God the Son is an intercessor. Uh, in Romans 8, 34, it says, Who is to condemn? And I'll put this out to you. Who can condemn you? There's only one person who can really condemn you. There's only one judge. It's Jesus. And here's the beautiful thing for you and I as believers, is that Jesus died for you. That's what Romans says. Jesus is the one who died for you. And more than that, he was raised, and you can imply it, for you, who today is at the right hand of God, and indeed he is interceding for us. He's interceding for you right now. This is what Jesus does. It's not just the Holy Spirit's role. This is what Jesus does. He's interceding for you right now. Have you ever thought about that? Like, what, what does Jesus do right now in heaven? Well, he takes the role of an intercessor. He has your interest in mind. How rare is that? That someone would put their own interest aside to take up your cause, take up your pain, take up your suffering, take up your interest, take up your hopes, take up your dreams. Knows you inside and out. Jesus Jesus. In Hebrews 7, this isn't on, on the slide, but it also references his role in heaven about being he's a high priest. He lives eternally to make intercession for us. There's a reference there. Again, that priesthood. He's, he stands between. Uh, where priests in the Old Testament had to make sacrifices ongoing, right? Jesus made one perfect sacrifice. It was the cross. And I'll get to this in a minute. Let me come back to that moment, or come back to that thought. As, Isaiah 53, uh, 12. It's a part of a passage in, in Isaiah that uh, scholars have coined a song of the suffering servant. And it's a beautiful, uh, a beautiful passage that really paints a clear picture of what Christ is going to do on the cross. And um, verse 12 says this, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death 
and was numbered with the transgressors, and yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession. Can I hear intercession? intercession. For the transgressors. How did he do it? He did it because he gave himself. He numbered himself among trans. He wasn't a transgressor, but he was numbered among them, right? Willingly taken to the cross. So here's the question. How is Jesus at our intercession? Is, he, is, is it like he's in heaven and he's like, is he... Is he making requests on our behalf? Like, is the Holy Spirit, is it, is it like a chain, you know? He's like, okay, well, uh, you know, Jimmy has, uh, has this need. All right, here, here, Jesus, I'm going to throw it to you. And Jesus is like, okay, I got that. All right, he goes to the Father, you know? No, it's not like that at all. <laughs> uh, for Jesus, it's less about prayer. It's not, not the prayer thing. It's, it's, for him, it's a fact, there's a, there's a man today in heaven. You know how extraordinary that is? When Jesus came to earth, uh, the New Testament tells us that he, uh, he emptied himself of his divine attributes and became a human being, just like you and me. He's fully God. He's fully man. And when he dies, as, you know, there's references about him still having the scars on his hands and his feet that represented before the throne of God. What Hebrews says, you and I can come before um, the throne of grace with boldness. Boldly come before the throne of grace. Why? How can you and I come before God? I mean, really, before God. Boldly? Excuse me? It's because Jesus is standing there. And he's like, there's a man in heaven. There's a human being in heaven right now. He's perfect. And anything that you and I have done that would bring an offense to God's holiness, it has been paid. And so both in his humanity and in his sacrifice, it's presented right there. And in that way, you and I can come and we can make requests boldly, both for ourselves and on behalf of others. And here's the Holy Spirit right here in our midst, in your presence, right here, right now, knowing what it is that you need, knowing is what your friend needs, knowing what it is that your family needs, knowing what your future needs, knowing what your employer needs. And he's saying, would you come and would you partner with me? This is what God does. Can I hear an amen to that? Can I hear the word intercession? Intercession. It's a good word. God the Father is an intercessor. Now, that word is never used specifically, uh, that word associated with the Father. But I will say this. The Father does take actions that are intercessory in, in its kind. And I'll, give, I'll present a, a couple of these to you here. Um, in Genesis 3.21, early, early on, right, he creates the world, creates the environment. He fills it with life. And uh, the peak of creation is his own image placed in the earth to have dominion in the earth. And it's Adam and Eve. And, uh, verse, uh, and then they, they, they sin. Okay? So chapter 3 is all about the fall. It's about them eating something they're not supposed to eat. And uh, in verse 21, chapter 3, says this, And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skin and clothed them. So they just sinned. They just disappointed God. God calls out, Adam, where are you? And they come out in shame. And they're covered in fig leaves. And uh, they did the thing they weren't supposed to do. And it says here that God clothed them with animal skin. Can I ask you a question? Who named all the animals? Adam. Adam named. Yeah, God brought them all before Adam. Adam's sitting there one by one. He's like, I'm going to name that one. I'm going to name that one. I'm naming it. He was intimately familiar with every animal that came across his path. One of them had to die. He'd never seen it before. There wasn't death like that in, in the garden. He was in charge. He was appointed to be the one to, to lead, to rule, to be empowered, to extend God's rule and organization and order in, in the garden and what would be beyond. He failed. And God said, well, the plant isn't good enough. Fig trees aren't what you need. What you need is the animal skin. I can't imagine what it would have been like for, for him that, that, that day uh, to understand the weight of what he had done. And here's the thing is that God did promise, did he not, that if you eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that what would happen to him? He would die, right? Did he die right then? He didn't die. It was the mercy of God, wasn't it? It was the mercy of God in that something else died in that moment so that he didn't have to. That's the lesson we take from it. Now, did he die eventually? Sure. A long, 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 long time from then, you know. It was animal skin. 
uh, Isaiah 53. Uh, again, we're going to return to this, this song of the suffering servant. In verses uh, 6 and 7, and then the first part of verse 10. It says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned, every one of us, to our own way. And Yahweh, or the Father, has laid on him, meaning the Messiah, the iniquity of us all. He's that animal that was sacrificed in the garden that day. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shear is silent. And so he opened not his mouth. And in verse 10 it says, Yet it was the will of Yahweh, the Father, to crush him. And then you get the prayer of Gethsemane where Jesus prays out, Lord, if there be any way this cup can pass from me, that would be great. Right? But not my will. Right? But yours. And it says it pleased the Father to crush him. What? Be- on our behalf. It's intercession. That's what it is. He's, he's, he's providing a way forward. He's the negotiating party that went out ahead of us before the enemy's army devours us, makes a deal, sets terms. He's the intercessor. He's a redeemer. He's our problem solver. You know, when God created Adam and created humanity, created us, God said this, let us make, let us make Adam, humanity, in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion. God gave humankind power to rule over the earth as a representative under, under him, uh, and it was his plan that Adam should do nothing without God. And that's, that's kind of obvious, right? I think we preach that enough, I'm sure. I know uh, you've got a culture here to understand that, that there's no, I'm not going to do anything on my own without God. Right? I'm dependent on him. I'm relying on him. And if I think I'm self-sufficient, it's probably folly. Um, which is kind of interesting to think, though, is that the flip side is also true. Is that God, not because he can't, but because he won't. He self-restrained himself that he won't exercise only but a certain degree of influence apart from us. Why, why did Adam exist? Couldn't God have cared for the garden? Couldn't God, if he, one word is all it took to bring it all to pass, could not a single word have also sustained it? Yeah, that wasn't the point. The point was that he, that he took such joy in creating you and I to know him, relate with him, and extend his order into this beautiful world that he made. And then when it was broken, his goal was to restore that. It's not that God can't do it apart from you. Of course he can. God wants to do it with us. And so he's purposely restrained himself, if you will, right? And, so, and that is the redemption plan, is to elevate and to, 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 bring, to, to awaken us to the fact that, like, this life isn't just about me. This is about God wanting to bring his kingdom to earth, on earth as it is in heaven. And the Holy Spirit's an intercessor. The Son is an intercessor. And the Father, he acts in ways that's intercessory-like. He's a redeemer. And there's the invitation for you and I to join him. Uh, when my, uh, so I've got four kids. My, my third board, I have two girls, two boys, my oldest son. He had an interest in playing basketball uh, sometime back. So my wife and I signed him up to play basketball at the local YMCA. And it was cute, man. I mean, you got little kids running around, you know, trying to dribble. And, I mean, they're, 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 they're traveling all over the place. You know, referees aren't calling it. Um, well, anyway, so I signed up for like a, I don't know, it was like a seven through nine. Uh, it was a second time playing. Um, and it's, it's parent run. I mean, meaning like, aside from the refs, like parents are the ones who, who lead the team, they coach, right? And if you've done that, you can't know this anyway. So no, no parent. No, I, have, I have 300 kids also playing basketball. It's Tim and two others, so three kids all together, all different teams. I can't coach them all, you know. You know but as you can tell by my physique, I'm, I'm a pretty good athlete. Yep, thank you. So anyway, so I was in high school, you know, I mean, I, I played some ball, you know, at JV, varsity, and then uh, I have some pickup ball in college. And mind you, I haven't touched a basketball in like over 20 years, okay? But, uh, but anyway, I thought, you know what, I can coach this. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a team of seven to nine-year-olds. And uh, so I step in, and I just thought I, I can help coach. And so another parent stepped in with me, and we did it together. It was actually really fun. Uh, but but here's, a, here's, a, here's a, just, just for the sake of it, I'm going to ask you a question. So I'm taller, bigger. Uh, I know how to play the sport. I guarantee if I step onto that court with, with, with those kids, we would win every game. Hands down. Right? I mean, I could almost, I mean, it's an eight-foot thing. I could dunk the ball. <laughs> I, could, I could look, like, awesome. 
<laughs> right? But no coach is stepping on the court to play with it. Right, because that's not the role of the coach, is it? That's not my role. All right, so how do I extend influence on the court? All right, I've got to coach them. Right, they gotta get the players to do to do the plays. I gotta get them to play defense. They gotta get the players to understand what offense is. Get it in the right basket. This is how you dribble the ball. This is how you don't travel. This is how you pass. Hey, you're a team. It's not just you, right? So we're influencing this whole thing called basketball. But I'm on the sidelines. I want you to think of it this way. This is what God and you and I are like. We're the players, and God is the coach. And He's gonna extend influence. He's gonna help us win. Uh, if we have the ear to, to listen. And sometimes the kid will listen. Most of the time, they, they're just kind of doing their own thing. <laughs> Sadly, that's probably like us, right? Uh, but that's the arrangement. That's the arrangement that we have. Hey, not only is God an intercessor, but he, he wants you to join him. That's the point this morning. He wants you to join him. It is a partnership that he's looking for. And if this is what he does, we're going to be like him, right? You're made in his image then whether you realize it yet or not, he is drawing you, inviting you, asking you, would you step into this intercessory place? Now, it's different than Jesus. Jesus already paid the price. He's in heaven. He's our, you know, Holy Spirit is our advocate right here and now. But there's a part. So what role do we play? What role do we play? So just like in the garden, it wasn't, God's not the one that, that sustained it. He put you and I in the midst of the earth to say, would you bring order? Would you bring kingdom? Would you bring heaven to earth? And we do it because we recognize that we're not actually in charge. We don't actually have the authority on ourselves. I don't have the power, but he does. And it's this, inter it's this interdependent relationship that we have with him that actually changes things in the affairs of this world. I'm in that Bible study meeting, and, and someone's sitting there in a hot seat, and you know we pray over them for a bit, and uh, the Holy Spirit thing, and I saw some bona fide miracles. How'd that happen? It didn't happen because we didn't pray, I can tell you that, right? I don't know. God says pray. There's some things that won't happen in this world unless you pray. That's the truth of it. And some things don't happen in this world until you look beyond your own need to see the need of another, and you step out and say, I'm going to pray for that person. I'm going to pray for that need. I'm going to pray for that region. I'm going to pray for that family. I'm going to pray for that nation, pray for that church. So, so a couple of myths. I think I think myth number one is that is that intercession can be identified. I think uh, misidentified as a spiritual gift. So I've heard some people say, "Well, it's not my gift. You know, I don't, I, that, that's someone else's gift." Let me just clarify for you that on four occasions in the New Testament, spiritual gifts are labeled. It's Ephesians four, it's uh, Romans twelve, First Corinthians twelve, and First Corinthians fourteen. On none of those lists is the word intercession found. You know why? It's not a gift. It's a calling to all of us. It's, it's, it's just, this is what God does. And if this is what God does, this is what we do. It's a, it's a privilege. And I, and I understand, you know, Father Nash used the word duty. It's a privilege. It's a privilege <laughs> to come alongside somebody else. First Timothy 2 says this, right? First of all, I urge the supplication, prayer, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and those in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life godly and dignified in every way. I love it. He's like, pray, you know, pray for the president, pray for the congressman, pray for your local representatives, pray for the mayor, pray for the governor. Why? That we might lead a life that's peaceful. That we might lead a life where we can actually have the freedom to do the things and extend the gospel in the way that they would honor the Lord. And intercession is the work of every follower of Christ. I think a second myth, this one I want to just, just if I could pop the balloon, uh, would, be, would be the balloon of um, if God wants it done, he doesn't need me. Now, we talked about that already a little bit. Um, but uh, there was a, uh, a man named William Carey. He was born in the 1700s. And uh, he's kind of designated today. He has the, the moniker um, Father of Modern Missions. Now, he wasn't really the first person to, to take the gospel to, in, in a cross cultural context. But uh, in the modern era, he was the first, uh, he was among the first uh, Europeans to do missions in India. And that, that was really his legacy. And uh, he, he, he wrote an essay that, that launched a whole society. It's called the Baptist Missionary Society. Uh, he went to India himself. He started schools for impoverished children and started a theological uh, school that was there as well. And uh, there's a lot uh, about him that's, that's incredible to read, and I encourage you in some time. When he was a young minister, he shared his desire uh, in publicly. 
uh, one of the first times he began to kind of share this heart for, for the, to do evangelism outside of his context uh, for, for others. And um, there was a, a, a senior minister in the midst. His name was Dr. Ryland. And he said uh, to William Carey, young man, sit down. When God is pleased to convert the heathen world, he will do it without your help or mine. And um, thankfully, Carey was unmoved by his disapproval. <laughs> <laughs> and he went on to do some incredible, incredible things for God. And um, I think William Carey represents for us uh, the truth. It's like Matthew six ten, when Jesus said, Pray then like this, your kingdom come, that your will be done here on the earth as it is in heaven. And it requires this partnership in prayer. No other things we can do more than pray? Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, can I open my mouth and can I share my testimony? Yeah, of course. Can I do good works? Of course. Can I, can I serve the poor? Yes. Should we? Yes, 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 yes. At the same time, let us not neglect the prayer closet. There are good things we can do, but like Finney, I'm not sure he would have been sustained apart from Nash's intercession. Things in our life that maybe not come to pass unless we are interceding and praying in this way. The truth is God's will is not accomplished on earth apart from intercessory work of God's people. It's not because God can't, it's just he won't. And then there's an objection I want to address, and it's the objection that if I, what if I pray and nothing changes? Like, what if I step out and I pray for this person? I shun die for a good 30 minutes, you know? And I'm all for that, but let's say you pray and nothing happens, you know? Well, if I don't pray, nothing will happen. But what if I do? Is anything lost, really? If I intercede for this person, this need, this region, is anything lost other than the time that you spent with God? Can God order your inner world at the same time? Of course, that could be a win. But even in the external, I would, I would rather this. I'd rather go down fighting. I want to contend in the spirit. I'm believing the whole way. And if it takes me to my dying breath, believing God will change something. I would rather take that position personally than to be defeated and feel like, you know what, I don't have enough faith. And it's, you don't have to be a, a, a mighty man of faith. It just takes a little bit. This takes a little bit. There are others. I don't know if I have time to, to hit them all. But I, mean, just, you know, I mentioned earlier about, about, about once in a while, like if, if you're a parent, maybe your child will take interest and they might come alongside and do something to bless you. There are people in, in Scripture who do, have done that. And it's, and it's always intercessory. It's always something that they, they take some interest in, in God. Abraham, he, 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 he has this conversation with God about, about whittling down uh, the number of righteous people in Sodom. He intercedes for Sodom, and God listens. Moses intercedes on behalf of Israel. God listens. Uh, you know, it's about Eli Elijah as, as a man, just like you and I. Yeah, he, is, his, he intercedes, and he prayed, and God listened. And um, I want you to know this. God's inviting you to prayer. Join him in intercession. And let's bring heaven to earth. You know, amen to that. All right, a couple, a couple practical thoughts here. One is that in, you have a, uh, not just now the month of prayer is over. I know every, every Wednesday morning at 6.30 uh, here, uh, not here, actually it's at the barn, uh, 6.30 on Wednesday mornings, there's a prayer meeting, Red Church prayer meeting, um, before work, uh, before the day starts, maybe before dropping off your kids at school, would you consider coming and praying for an hour together in corporate prayer. And you don't learn to pray just by reading about prayer. You don't learn to pray just because we're inspired. We learn to pray by praying with other people. And uh, an intercession, corporate prayer, is uh, often intercessory in its kind. It almost has to be because you're joining your faith with the people about something else. And so you are stepping into intercession corporately every Wednesday morning. Uh, if you can't make it in person, you can join actually online. And I was looking, perusing. Uh, Sharon told me here that you've got a group. It's called Morning Prayer Group. It's in the catalog that you have when you walked in. And uh, so if you can't make it in person, you can sign up through the group. And it's a, it's a Zoom link, and you have the password there. I mean, encourage you. Would, you, would you. would you jump in to the stream of prayer that's continuing here in red? Uh, would you do that? And then another I have a resource here for you as well. And... Uh, this is, there are a handful of uh, apostolic prayers, prayers that were prayed by Apostle Paul or maybe others that are written into the epistles, written into the letters. 
And I have an example on the back from Colossians 1.9. I just wanted to simply walk through this. Uh, read, pray, and launch. It's just a simple uh, formula. And so you would just take one of these passages at the bottom. This is New Testament apostolic prayers. Oh, I don't know. There's a good 12, 13, 14 of them that are there. And you would just take that one verse and you'd read it. Just familiarize yourself. Just kind of what's, what's the structure? What's the grammar? What's, what's the heartbeat about the, 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 this uh, scripture is conveying and then just pray it you just read it but in place of where it says you you put the person's name you put whatever group their name in the, in the middle of it and then as you get to feel it launch it, don't, don't be limited to the template but but you got a heartbeat now of what it is that god's desire is uh, for this person uh, this need and so i'm going to just use this as an example so in colossians 1 9 it says, and so from the day we heard it, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Who doesn't want that prayed over their life? That's beautiful, right? All right. So we're going to stick Uncle Jim in the middle of this. All right. God, I pray for my Uncle Jim. And you're just going to just read it right in the text. Holy Spirit, I ask that you fill Jim with the knowledge of your will. Fill him with all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Lord, you know it's my desire that when did Jim walk in the manner worthy of you? Dot, 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 dot. You fill in the blank, right? You just keep, you keep going with, with that verse. That's just praying it. Then you launch, right? You're going to go back to it. You'll come back again. But now it's a template. God, you know Uncle Jim is not following your way. By your spirit, constrain his path. Guide his decisions, God. Reveal yourself in miraculous ways. Jim, I call forth the purposes of God in your life. Be filled with the knowledge of God's will. I pray that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. I call an end to the folly in your life. Be filled with spiritual wisdom, and you fill in the blank from there. Right? Familiarize yourself. Read it through. You put the name right there in the text. Right? That unsaved loved one or the unloved saved one, either one. Joke. Okay? And, um, and then you launch. All right, simple formula. I hope that is helpful for you uh, as you maybe take some steps in this direction. But I just want you to know this. Hey, God is an intercessor. This is what he does. And he wants you to join him. He wants you to partner with him. And there are some things in this world that will not happen. Heaven won't come to earth unless we say yes to that task. Can I amen to that? Lastly, can I hear the word intercession? Intercession. Can I pray for us? Father, thank you today that you have held back nothing from us. And, uh, and God, we hear your call. And uh, God, to the extent that your Holy Spirit is pricking our hearts, we respond. And God, we say thank you today as we take that step in faith. God, will we see miracles? God, will we see lives really changed and transformed? And we believe you, God, Lord, till our dying breath, and knowing, God, that there is your heaven waiting to come and shift things on earth. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Steve. Let me give Pastor Steve a hand. We're always grateful to have him here with us, part of the Red Church family. As he was talking about, and we've been talking about prayer, and today, specifically intercession, I was reminded of my my late grandmother. She she passed away um, recently. I think it was last year or the year before, um, at the age of 95. And one of the things that she was so faithful in was she was the prayer intercessor for the family. She took that upon herself every day to be lifting up our family in prayer. And that was so encouraging for us as a family to know that we had someone who was who was fighting for us in, in the spiritual realm, praying for us together. Um, and that's something that I want to uh, aspire to, just seeing, seeing her example for the last several years of her life, she was homebound, so she couldn't get around and, and go places. But one of the things that she always took upon her was to carry that mantle. She took that seriously to lift us up in, in prayer. So that's something I, I aspire to and want to teach. We want to teach our, our young boys to be doing that in prayer as well. So thank you for that message on intercession. God wants to join us wants us to join him with what he's doing. 
We'll have a few details here just as we get ready to, to close today. You should have received in your bulletin a connection card when you came in today. Looks like this. On the front you see there's contact information, and then on the back there are some next steps. If there's a next step that speaks to you, go ahead and check that, and if there's a prayer request, we'd be happy to pray with you, more than welcome to pray with you during, during the season, whatever is going on in your life. And you also should have received, on the end of the um, connection card, there's a guest ticket. If this is your first, second, or third time with us today, we'd like you to fill that out. And don't drop that in the buckets when they come by from the ushers, but actually take that out either one of our doors um, to guest services. And we have a gift that we would like to give you as a, as a thank you for joining us today. So you can also fill out your connection card and guest ticket, everything I just mentioned. There's a QR code on the seats in front of you. You can do that also up here on the screen as well. So if you'd prefer um, digital instead of paper, we're, we're welcome for you to do that as well. In a moment, we're going to receive our, our tithes and offerings so the ushers can go ahead and get into their places. At Red Church, we believe that we can honor God in a variety of ways through our worship, through our serving, and also as we give. Today. So I wanted to share with you something that your that your giving is doing here at Red Church. As you heard in the announcement video earlier today, we have small groups that are going to be starting up here in just a few weeks. And I wanted to highlight one of those groups. We have um, several groups that we call our, our core small groups that we want everyone at, at Red Church to go into at some point. And one of those groups is called Foundations. And we really believe in that group because it helps people to grow in their faith. It sets a strong foundation for them in the faith. It goes through the core tenets of Christianity, the core beliefs of our faith, and what they mean to us. So one of the components of that group is that there is um, a book part of that. Uh, when you join that group, there's a book to purchase, and not everyone has the resources to be able to do that. So for those of you who give, you may be the reason that someone was able to take that small group at all, that they were able to be part and to be able to take their notes in, in that book. So we want to thank those of you who give because you are a part of discipling people here at Red Church, growing them in their faith in a very practical way. So there are a few ways that you can give today. As you see up on the screen, there's, um, there's the QR code again in front of your seat. You can scan that to give. Um, there's also text to give, and the um, information for that is up on the screen, how to do that. You can give at redchurch.cc. You can give through our app, which is in the Google Play Store and the App Store. Or you can just drop the offering envelope that you have in your bulletin in the buckets as those come by. So I'm going to go ahead and release the ushers, and they'll go ahead and collect the connection cards and the offering envelopes. Have a couple other quick announcements here for you. There is that invite card that was mentioned to you earlier that you got in your bulletin. So that's not something, as I believe Sharon said earlier, you don't just put that up on your fridge. It's not just something for you to <laughs> just hang up on your fridge, but that is something for you to invite people to our upcoming series and what we have going on here. So please take that and invite someone to Red Church. And also want to um, encourage you, if you have not taken the growth track, we have Red 101 today. Red 101 is where you have an opportunity to learn more about what Red Church is about and for us to get to know you a little bit better as well. So if you're interested in taking the growth track, you can head out the, the double doors to, to my right and there'll be someone out there to invite you. There's there's childcare, um, there's snacks provided as well, So, and you don't have to take them in order. However, those of you that do like to do things in order, today is the first week of the month, so you can start with Red 101, so you can do that today as well. All right, well, if you have prayer for any reason, and maybe you would like to have someone join you personally in prayer, there'll be people up here at the front of the sanctuary to join with you in that. We'd be happy to pray with you. And right now, I also want to invite one of our elders, Mark Thornton, up to the stage, and he is going to pray a prayer of blessing over us today. Thank you, Nathan. Would everyone please stand? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for bringing us here or allowing us to tune in online to hear this important message through your servant. Father, we also thank you for hearing us when we pray. And I pray that that knowledge, plus the words that we have heard here today, will be our incentive to expand and maximize our prayer lives, particularly our intercessory prayers. And Father, I also pray a blessing over everyone watching, both here and online. 
And as they come and go this week, they will know that their Father in Heaven, the Creator of the universe, loves them specifically, wants an eternal relationship with them, and wants what's best for them. And I pray that that knowledge will encourage and strengthen us all. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please greet two or three people as you leave and enjoy the rest of your weekend. And don't forget to sign up for small groups.